it is now the afternoon. You guys just have food. So um, the other plea, oh, the other part of the introduction that we forgot uh, there was that it was not part of the bio. We're the skunks in the in the garden party uh, because we published that paper recently. So uh, about the telehealth. So um, I thank uh, both Elizabeth and Mario for bringing that up. So. Um, the key thing I wanted to emphasize is that uh, I, in, in the talk here, I would really, this theme of the idea of doing research in the form of telehealth that's unbiased and trying to inform the debate, both clinical and policy, really resonates with me. And so I'm excited to be here at this first uh, session. I also want to emphasize that the fun part for me about research is the dialogue. And so as I'm talking here, just both for the, your fellow colleagues here to kind of wake everyone up as well as just because I think it's more fun. Please ask questions while I'm talking here. So I wanted to, um, <clears throat> I wanted to do cover three things with you. Um, the first was I was, when I heard about this uh, session, I thought, where is telehealth, telemedicine research going? Give you some my, my, my own ideas. I know that uh, Elizabeth articulated some ideas on where it should go. I'll give you my own thoughts. Then I wanted to um, present to you some ongoing research, uh, some published and ongoing research about very descriptive studies on how telehealth is being used in the United States right now, or at least uh, those done by video conference. And then also going beyond those video conference uh, visits to describe some work we've done on other forms of telehealth, specifically symptom checkers. So with that as a start, the thing, uh, when people have talked about disparities research, they've talked about generations of disparities research. And this has been a real framework for a lot of work that's been done on that topic. The idea was the first generation of disparities I don't know what happened. Okay, so uh, I'll tell you what the generations of disparities research were. Something happened to the screen here. The first generation was simply documenting that there are disparities. That was the first generation. Highlighting to the community that this is a problem. The second generation of uh, tell, uh, disparities research was why are there disparities? And trying to understand that. And now the current generation, which people have really pushed in that uh, research field, is interventions to try to improve and decrease the disparities that are out there. If we take that same framework and think about telehealth research, I would argue that the first generation of telehealth research was really arguing, just showing that you can do this, that you have something like palliative care. You can actually do it this way. The technology exists, that patients are willing to do it, um, and uh, that the providers can, are willing to also try this out. The second generation of telehealth research, as I see, is that really the rich work that was done by many of the folks in this room, but also outside, which is really to demonstrate in randomized controlled trials that, these stu that telehealth is equivalent in a randomized way to uh, the current care standard of care. So for example, a study of patients who have go, who are randomized to an in-person versus a uh, telehealth visit for uh, bipolar disease, or uh, OCD, or psoriasis. And where I really feel like we need to move forward in terms of telehealth research is this third generation, which is really the population effect. Which is now, okay, we've established that this is a feasible option. Really what I think is next is how do we take that research and demonstrate that it's improving the health of the US population? And that's the type of work. And it requires a little bit of a different framing. Instead of focusing on those who receive telemedicine versus those who do not, really I think it's about taking a population of people who were exposed or offered telemedicine and seeing at that population level, has it improved health? And the second thing I think is different a little bit about the framing if you were going to look into population effects is it's not about telemedicine versus in-person visits. It's rather the standard of care, what is currently provided in the community, and what if we add telemedicine on top of that, what is the impact? So that's my own idea that at least drives a lot of the work that I'm doing right now is to try to understand this form of telehealth and uh, sorry, do this type of research. Um, and I'll turn next to some of the ongoing work in terms of uh, 
So if that's the idea, this is how we're going to use telehealth research, uh, how the next phase of research, how is telehealth being used right now? Judd made the point that when we looked at the posters out there, that most of the abstracts had a very small N. And if we're going to have an effect on a population scale, we need a lot bigger in terms of numbers. So I'll describe to you some of the work we've been doing first in the Medicare population. As you know, there's ongoing debates in the Congress within CMS. I know many of you have been part of that about how do we expand how uh, telehealth is used in Medicare. How is it currently being used? And we published a piece um, in, I don't know, <laughs> another one of these. Uh, uh, we published a paper in JAMA that, uh, uh, <laughs> last year that described some of that, uh, um, just a simple descriptive study of that, a research letter. Let me highlight a couple of the things we found. The first is, in terms of telemedicine visits per 1,000 Medicare beneficiaries, um, you can see that in terms of 2005 all the way to 2013, we now have 2014 data. We're seeing about, uh, in states with telemedicine parity laws and without, uh, up to about 10 visits per thousand. So the numbers are quite small. These are among rural Medicare beneficiaries. The total N is about 140,000 in 2014. Our estimates based on the growth rate, we're seeing about 40 to 50% per year. Probably by 2016, we're about a quarter of a million visits. How is it being used? So we have all these visits. These are the, what the diagnoses were for those visits. Just under 80% of those visits were for mental health disorders. And then you can see a little bit for neurology issues. Those were actually dementia. So those same clinicians were providing that care. And then you can see how it spans out. So one insight maybe not so informative for all of you is that when we talk about telemedicine, at least in the Medicare population, it's basically telemental health. All of these other ones are really right now rounding error in very, very small numbers. And so that's really where we're seeing the use of telemedicine in that population. One of the things that we were really struck with is how much is it expanding care across state boundaries and where are these clinician uh, patient pairs that, uh, who are receiving telemedicine. One thing that I thought was interesting is and we can argue why this is the case with the regulations, et cetera, et cetera. But the vast majority, almost all of the cases, the beneficiary and the provider themselves are in the same state. We're not seeing, at least right now, many clinicians who are going across state lines. The mean distance from residents to the tel uh, telemental health provider was about 103 miles. And it was interesting. We were curious about how is this interaction occurring? Who are these patients and who are these providers? A couple of things that I thought were interesting was I wanted to know whether this was, I don't have someone in my community I can see, so I'm only going to see that provider via telehealth. Or is it, are there in some cases situations where the telehealth provider is using this as an adjunct? So sometimes they'll see you in person and sometimes they'll see you remotely or uh, via telehealth. And we find that about 25% of these patient provider pairs also have in-person visits. So it's kind of interesting between uh, comparison between the two. Another interesting thing is we were curious to say that in rural America right now, that's the people who can receive uh, telemedicine in Medicare, it's only those, uh, uh, and there's a real need, as all of you know, for mental health specialty providers. Is it expanding the number of patients who are getting telemental health specialty care or not? What we found I thought was really interesting was the vast majority of those patients who received telemental health also received in-person telemental health specialty care. Only about 13% of patients were receiving mental health specialty care only via telehealth. So I think it's interesting. I think what I interpret from that is that the majority of telemental health right now is taking a patient population in need and supplementing the amount of care they're get getting, mostly from psychiatrists. That's who the uh, majority of the providers are. But it isn't really expanding the pool of patients in these populations who are getting care. Does that make sense? No. Well, you know, if you're going to ask a population-based question, you have to be convinced that 
Your intervention changes the population, and they're, they're endpoints that are measurable. And I'm not criticizing mental health, you know, but, I mean, the question is, would that be measurable in the population? Would you decrease suicide rates or our, our institutionalization of patients as a result of the intervention? You know, it's those sort of, again, bigger questions that are beyond necessarily what you're doing with telemedicine, but does whatever you're doing change outcome? You, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Independent of... Right. So, so I guess there's a couple questions. First... Thank you for asking a question. <laughs> I encourage all of you to ask uh, questions. We'll uh, hopefully make this inter as interactive as possible. Second uh, point is you're asking the question if, if you let's set aside the whole thing of tele, and if you just do in-person mental health specialty care, does that improve outcomes? That's a big question. The perception is in the mental health specialty community, and others I know are in that community, I think they would argue yes. And the third question is, does it make a difference? That's what we're next, our next study is, to see, to measure it, and I'll show you some data, is to see within these communities in which mental, telemental health has grown rapidly, and I'll show you some numbers on that, has mortality fallen, suicides, hospitalizations, EDs, outcomes? Because that's what I think yeah. is really gonna excite the policy community in this area. Actually, just as a quick point that I want to do, uh, uh, I forgot to emphasize before, is if there's one thing that you'll see with this study and the next study that I think is a key limitation, and it's really, I think, the major issue is, are we really capturing in this population and in the commercially insured all of the telehealth that's being provided? Because one of the issues that we see is that we know a lot of patients are getting care where the mental health specialty provider is just simply not billing. How much? I don't know. Like, how much of the iceberg am I capturing here or not? I don't know the answer if others have some thoughts on that. But I think that's a key limitation as you see these numbers in terms of utilization. I know this is an undercount, but how much of an undercount it is? Some people had their hand raised. Judd, do you want? You know, I, th I think it's really critical to look at sort of the reliability of the data that you're looking at, because we know we're undercounting, but then, or we presume that, but then some of the people in the control group have also received telemedicine encounters. And then we're missing some of the people, e even potentially in the telemedicine group, that may have other visits. W one of the things that makes this really hard for me to get my hands around is we've discovered that the gold mine, and it might actually be an expensive gold mine or a or a life-saving gold mine, is canceled visits. And so you don't actually know who has a visit and never shows up for a visit. And so we actually, in our health system, and I'll you know, round it out to keep things in confidence, we have practices that sometimes have a 50% cancellation no-show rate, and on a low end are 20 or 30%. And so we've spent an enormous amount of time converting some of those to telemedicine visits because we believe that allows patients to, you know, potentially still get the care. And so I guess it's just hard when you can't take into account all of those little things that happen or can happen to pull it out of a database, especially, and I can only speak for our shop where I do know this, our coding's all over the freaking map. It's horrible. Uh, and we do have ways to figure out what's a telemedicine visit, but you don't have ways to see that in health services research because it's the visit type that we schedule, so it doesn't go into the claims database. Yeah, it. And so I guess my real question is, do you have a way or, or the bandwidth to take a segment of the hospitals that you're studying, for example, your California database or any other one, and actually ask them to pull the data from their hospital to see how accurate it is. Because if you're 70% accurate versus 90% accurate, you can draw wildly different conclusions from the data. Yeah, no, it's a really important point. And so in terms of trying to understand, uh, so the first point that I'm, ho well, it's an important issue in terms of trying to understand the numbers here and how that's done and whether, and it's also gonna vary by population, the Medicaid population, community mental health centers, private uh, practices and so forth. So I think it's gonna vary and I think it's an important point. Do you had your hand? I thought I saw a hand raised over here, sorry. So um, another, uh, 
thing that I think is really interesting is when we start looking at the geographic variation. So first, I should uh, start here. This is ten telemental health visits per 100 patients in those communities. And this is among those with serious mental illness. So these are patients with bipolar, schizophrenia, depression with psychotic features of the people that we looked at. That's about 4 to 5% of rural beneficiaries. They make about half of the visits that we're seeing in the population. Um, the thing that first jumped out at me is that we see some community or states where the number of visits per 100 beneficiaries is very high. We're seeing numbers, at, again, at a population level where I think you can start to see an impact, 25 visits. 50, uh, and uh, for up to 49 visits. Now, the denominator is small in some of these states, but I think it really is striking. The second thing is just the dramatic, and I think all of you know this, but just interesting for me to look at that graph, uh, that map, excuse me, and see you basically have some states with a large amount of telemental health, and then where I live in the Northeast, basically zero. We had, I think it was eight states that we didn't see in our data any telemental health visits, whether that means there were no telemental health, I think that's unlikely, but how little there's be, uh, being done, at least in the Medicare population. And I didn't highlight this. One of the things that was interesting for us was the fact that it didn't vary that much by parity laws. Again, this is the Medicare population, so maybe the parity laws don't matter. But I thought that was interesting. We did look at the regulatory environment, because that was something that has come up a lot. I know that Jay has been very interested in that issue uh, for different kinds of telemental health specialty providers. We kind of cheated. We went to the ATA, and they had published a report recently where they graded the different states based on their regulatory environment, specifically for psychologists. But we used that as a proxy, saying, look, if your regulatory environment for psychologists is uh, more amenable for telehealth, maybe that also applies to other mental health specialty fields. I think it's interesting there, we actually saw much bigger differences uh, where we're seeing a, almost a doubling of the visits per 100, again, with serious mental illness um, in states with an A grade versus those with a B or C or F grade. So a snapshot in terms of what we're seeing in the Medicare population, I wanted now to turn to what are we seeing nationally among the commercially insured. So we have access to data, I guess, are we taping this? No, we're not, oh, we are, all right. I can't say one of the largest <laughs> national uh, health plans out there. Uh, we have access to their data, and we're able to look through modifier codes and CPT codes, their use of telemedicine. So let me kind of provide some of those data also. Um, so this is the number of visits per 1,000 in this uh, employer. The cool thing about this data is we now even have data through 2017. So we just have a two or three month lag. So we're able to look at data right now. This is data through December of 2016. Um, we're seeing rates in terms of visits per 1,000 that very much track what we saw in the Medicare population um, with growth rates about 40 to 50% per year, which I think is, go ahead. This is currently all visits. Go ahead. Not yet. Go ahead, Jay. Are you able to parse out um, psychiatry visits versus psychology visits, social worker visits? So uh, both in this data as well as in the Medicare data, yes. You can look based on the provider ID. In the Medicare data, I don't remember what it is for this, but in the Medicare data, it was 65% of the telemental health visits were from psychiatrists. The me vast majority of the rest were from uh, psychologists. Uh, very, very few were from social workers. Um, so I'm now getting lost. I lost my uh, pointer here, so, or my clicker. So uh, you're seeing rates, again, very similar. And now we're seeing up to about 30. So I mean, this totals, my memory was around 120, 100 to 120,000 visits in that range uh, in 2016. Again, we'll see something probably 180, uh, 60 to 170,000 in 2017 based on the growth rate. One of the other things that's really striking is how like, that big uptick between 2015 and 16. And that 
uh, I'll tell you, is almost entirely driven by direct-to-consumer telemedicine, which has really taken off in this population. And on that note, what we're seeing in terms of the numbers, how is it being used? About half the visits now are direct-to-consumer. Um, in 2017, that'll be probably even higher. Another 36% are mental health, which before had been the majority. And then again, as similar to, I think, to the Medicare population, relatively few for other conditions. And there was no specific specialty or condition that we're seeing, at least, that jumps out at us in terms of that's where telehealth is being used. That's based on claims data, that's based on claims data also. Go ahead. Is the direct-to-consumer provided by the insurer? Oh. Is the direct-to-consumer provided by the insurer, or is it any direct-to-consumer so whether it be in a health system or one of the freestanding entities? Yeah, so, um, so as you're well aware, there are, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, previously there used to be this thing where you had insurers and you had providers. <laughs> and now in particular uh, with Live Health Online from Anthem, as well as some of the other insurers uh, really getting into being the provider also. This particular health plan is not a provider, and they have not, uh, they've covered a variety of direct to consumer. In terms of the number, the visits we're seeing, uh, our understanding is there's some issues in looking at the provider ID, so I don't know all the details, that these are all, the, almost all of these are the commercial companies, Teladoc, American Well, uh, Doctors on Demand. The number of visits that we're seeing in another data set also that are actually provided by health systems is pretty minimal. So there are a lot of health systems doing this kind of care, but in aggregate the numbers are so small that those, those, those private companies vastly dominate in terms of numbers. Direct to consumer, then it's not a mental health visit. Those are those are separate. So the direct to consumer oh, was so, uh, for something other than mental health. Yeah. So I apologize. So the direct to consumer are visits for acute respiratory illness, UTI, dermatologic conditions, back pain, those kind of conditions, and then the telemental health pr visits are from. And those telemental health visits are not by those direct to consumer companies. Those are by other providers. Did that? answer your question? And there was another one. Yeah, so I, I mean obviously you can only do telemedicine where telemedicine's available and you, you know you make the point that it's the direct to consumer companies that, that are driving this. I, I just throw out there, we're in our program probably 85 to 90 percent of visits are scheduled visits with either your own primary care provider or your specialist. We're one of the few programs that has that available. It totally dwarfs our direct-to-consumer business, even though our direct-to-consumer database is actually where we have focused our marketing efforts. And I think so over time, as more providers do this, there's a chance that that's actually the way the market shifts. Hard to know now. Yeah, we don't, yeah. I mean, I think it's a very important point, though. We don't, in terms of who's providing it right now. On the direct-to-consumer side, I would say just to emphasize the point right now, this is all commercial companies, not health systems. These are being provided by health systems predominantly. So, the, um, here again, there's that issue with the parity laws in this population. This is a graph I showed yesterday also, but we didn't see a difference there among these commercially insured in terms of growth, in terms of states with and without parity laws. And this particular insurer has covered telemedicine visits, obviously, for some time. One of the things we were interested in is what's driving this. So it didn't appear to be parity laws. We then broke down the different counties where these patients were. Uh, by their physician supply. So in red are those counties uh, with low physician supply in fuchsia, purple, uh, are those counties with a lot of physicians per capita. And then what we did is at a population level among all the residents in these different sets of counties looked at the growth of tele-mental health in this particular case. And you can see, at least for what I take away from this, is that those underserved communities are the places where telemental health is really growing. Uh, Go ahead. So you're looking at claims data or insurance data? But with direct-to-consumer, they don't go through insurance and they don't go through Medicare because they're self-pay. So how do you, I saw a graph that had 
you know, direct to consumer in there with everyone else, but they don't pay, um, they don't use GT modifiers because it's a self pay type of platform for direct to consumer. So, how do you? Segregate that. So, depending on the thing the study we've done, we've either used GT modifiers and or the particular tins, the tax IDs to identify the uh, direct to consumer providers. Um, in this health plan, as well as in other health plans, for example, Teladoc itself, almost all their visits are paid for by insurance. So they're not these companies, the ones we're seeing here, are focused on the insured population, and patients are paying a copayment. Or if they have a high deductible health plan, they're paying, you know, because it's under the deductible. But it is covered by insurance and a claim comes through. Okay, but a lot of them are set up where a person doesn't have to have insurance at all. So they just pay $49. Right. So in terms of the major companies, Doctors on Demand, American Well, and Teladoc, they're focused on the commercially insured. There are, and we've done another study where we did these uh, health uh, tele direct to consumer telemedicine companies that do not take insurance. They're focused on the cash business. My instinct, and I don't have numbers to back this up, but in terms of numbers, those places are relatively small. The most of the growth, at least we're seeing in terms of market capital, what people are saying in their public, you know, statements and so forth, is that these are the companies where that do take insurance, where the majority of the growth is occurring. Okay, because the reimbursement from home is not covered through the insurance plans. It is. Unless so, yeah. you're doing, you know, if the insurance company offers a direct-to-consumer platform, they're covering it, but for other services into the home, for telemedicine, they aren't covering those types of services. That, so that is completely correct. So let me just, I think I've uh, added some confusion, so let me make it clear. This particular insurer offers direct, covers direct-to-consumer telemedicine visits within the home through these commercially insure, uh, through these commercial companies. They do not provide direct uh, telehealth services for other conditions in the person's home. Is that, go ahead. Do you, find that to, do, you find, do you find that to be the exception and not really the rule? So others can jump in here. So my understanding is the, the, the places that I've looked on in terms of Aetna, Anthem, United, uh, other blue plans, except for Anthem plans, that that's pretty much the norm that I'm seeing. But I don't know, and I won't deny that you go to these websites and you try to understand some of the details and you speak to people in these companies and it gets kind of confusing. But that's my understanding right now that for the direct-to-consumer companies, they, for example, Aetna has a they hit contract only with Teladoc and that can be offered in the home. But other sorts of uh, direct-to-consumer companies, they do not. Does anyone have any other data on that? That's my understanding. I know Optum uh, allows uh, providers to use, sorry, I know Optum allows providers to use uh, approved platforms. So it may be a, a, a certain company, but certain individual providers that are Optum providers can use certain approved platforms, and there's a series of those that are offered online. And Optum and United, just make sure we're all on the same page, it gets very confusing or the same. Forty percent of the market is by at-risk companies, self-insured. They choose whether they want to allow, you know, like the direct-to-consumer stuff or not. And I think it's becoming, depending on how effective they are recruiting for the self-insured companies, like you know, Teladoc and, for instance, a big company in Alabama. That I noticed that they were offering direct-to-consumer stuff in Alabama, and I asked Blue Cross Blue Shield why. And they said because, you know, the company said that they wanted it. And so they and were doing I think it, that, so. Lori, do you remember this study? I think it was like one survey that was done of large employers at 87%, something like that. Huh? 9% uh, provide telehealth by the end of the year, I believe. And that was done in 2016. So 90% yeah. of these large self-insured employers were offering these direct-to-consumer products. I have a question about um, where your patients were located. If you're looking at the mental health care delivered by county supply of physicians, were you looking at where the patient's address of record is or where they were actually receiving their services? Because here in Northern Virginia, we have people that live under, you know, 50, 60 miles away from DC and are actually getting their services in DC, even though their address of record is out here. 
So great, uh, another limitation. So when you think about the work that we're doing, both in the Medicare population and these commercially insured, I have where the person lives. I don't, unfortunately, in the data that's provide, that we have in claims, it's very, very few of them have where the actual visit occurred if it's not done in the patient's home, if it's a telemental health visit. So that's, I think, a really important point. When we look at the population at a county level, and I'm showing you the variation in number of visits, that is taking every single person in that county, how many visits they got, no matter where that care was received. In looking at the, um, or finding these through uh, deductibles or wh however you can find them, there's a very significant variation in how the, in some of the insurers have implemented copays. Is it a primary visit? Is it a specialist visit? Is it a small copay? Large? Do you have any ability to filter on the kind of copay? Yeah, I think it's a really important point, which is that the, the current um, your benefit design could really impact quite a bit on how you, this care is received. Um, and just to go back to the, the study that Elizabeth started with, with Lori and I did on there, that was a population that had a relatively generous benefit design, so they had to pay relatively low. So what would that look like if we had a more, you had people, uh, high deductible plans? I don't know. So one of the sec dirty secrets is that health plans don't know the, ben like when they, we look at claims data, it's very hard for us to figure out the benefit design because every employer out there has their own benefit package. So I had work, we were working with one employer. They had 120 different benefit designs for one employer in terms of co-payments, co-insurance, because they had acquired all these companies and everyone had a HMO, PPO, POS product. So surprisingly, I can put people into bins of PPO, HMO, but to know specifically what their deductible is or their coinsurance or copayment for everything else, because every employer demands their own specific benefit design, which is a real prop. Well, maybe good for the employer, but it's a pain for me as a researcher. Go ahead. And to just to throw it out there, these insurance companies are getting into the remote patient monitoring space as well. So in addition to direct to consumer, they're, they're doing their own remote patient monitoring, especially for chronic diseases. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So, I just had a question about the pie chart before. So, for um, yeah, hi. Um, so, for the DTC visits, now that they're increasingly getting into the space of um, mental health, are you going to be recategorizing the visits, or are you going to be separate? Yeah. So this is going to be yeah. uh, in that particular case. Right. If there was a direct to consumer right. visit for mental health issues, that was in the blue That's book. That's in the blue, okay. <laughs> it's so, so confusing. <laughs> There's two other questions. So you, you mentioned, you know, having other kind of insurance products kind of buried within. So have you had the ability to look at kind of a straight fee for service versus more of like a population per member per month type setup? Because it seems to me like a lot of telemedicine benefits can be avoiding visits and things like that, whereas like a mental health, you know, it's kind of a swap one for one. Yeah, so in the data that we're seeing, just to state the obvious, so right now in terms of capitated environments, we see capitated environments per person per month, per member per month environment, generally in the Medicaid population. There's relatively little capitation going right now in the commercially insured and obviously not in Medicare. Um, so in terms of these data, that is less of an issue. I think in the Medicaid population, it'd be very different. The second point to make is that we do have, where hope is, is that ACOs and others who, uh, uh, physician groups or large systems that take risk, we would see something very different. As you're well aware, Medicare, in terms of the next generation ones, uh, ACOs, I feel it's like the Star Trek analogy. <laughs> the next gen ACOs, um, they are allowed to use uh, telehealth even if it's in, in an urban area. And we're interested to see what's happening. Right now, the numbers are so slow, so low that right now it's not worth even investigating, but I'm hopeful in the next couple of years we'll be able to investigate that question that provider systems that take risk, are they using more telehealth and how are they using telehealth? Are they using it in different ways than we're seeing the rest of the system? As we dig into the work you've done, and several slides earlier you showed the, the utilization rates based upon states that had parity laws and didn't, but the parity law state numbers are changing from 2010 to 2016. So is it those states who had parity laws at the end of 2016 
all the way across, or is it? Yeah, so uh, great point. Sorry, this is one of those things where I didn't go into the methods. We took everyone who had a parity law through 2012. So if you got a parity law in 2015, you, didn't, okay. you were in the blue bin. <laughs> So I don't know like how long does it take for a parity law to have effect, but that's at least what we did crudely. And then there's all these things like parity laws is not a parity law, and there's like a thousand different variations. So exactly, yeah. Where is Mario? He's a, so uh, he would be helping you know help figure that out. And I think that's an interesting question to kind of think about the different flavors of parity laws. This is kind of crude. Yes, you got something versus no, you got nothing. Great, well thank, this is exciting for me, all these <laughs> questions, so keep on going here. So, um, so one of the things was interesting, this was telemental health. I would argue that this demonstrates that telemental health is going into communities where there is a real need, at least on physician supply. How about direct to consumer telemedicine? Not so much. Um, these are again stratifying the different counties by supply, and if anything, we're seeing that the greatest use was in those counties where there was the largest supply of providers. Could you run by socioeconomic status or? Could you look at it instead of physician supply, but socioeconomic status um, indicators in that county? Because I think those two correlate pretty well, the low SES and you know, Yeah, so we do not, it's a really good point, we should. Um, and we are gonna look at predictors just in general in a multivariate model in terms of what predicts the use of uh, direct-to-consumer telemedicine. In some of the other work we did, you know, I don't think it's surprising that first there's a strong correlation uh, between socioeconomic status and provider supply. Um, those counties that have rich people have more docs. Um, so I think there would probably see the same relationship. And also then within a county that has rich people, who is more likely to use it? Younger people, uh, those who are less plugged into the healthcare system, but we can look at it some other ones also. I'm almost curious about the broadband access. So if the counties who are not using are also the ones who don't have broadband to the home. Yeah, so I think for the, in particular the Medicare when we're focused so in terms of the rural communities, I think that'll be a really critical thing to, and we're, we at least hope to use uh, the FCC's broadband map to try to see if we can see there's that relationship between the two. Yeah, I, I think an easy thing that would be interesting to look at to give you a, a, a different set here is providers per thousand patient or a thousand people in the area. Oh, I apologize. When I said provider supply, it's not the raw number. It is per capita physician supply. Okay. This is, this is data na uh, from the ARF, which is the Area Health Resource File, which is from the, uh, that's the NCHS, from the right, feds. And that's all physicians per in the, who are practicing in there. In okay, the, in I'm the still hung up on the direct-to-consumer. So the direct-to-consumer patients that are in the sample are patients that are covered under the health plan or under the insurance plan. So there's no... Um, uninsured people or people with other insurance plans that are using these platforms? Right, so just to be clear, these data that I'm showing you are from one commercial insurer national in scope. And so when we go back to the socioeconomic status issue also, these are people who have commercial insurance. And so by their very nature are going to be in a different strata of socioeconomic right. status. It does not include Medicaid population, does not include uh, those who are uninsured. Um, and therefore is gonna have fewer of those disadvantaged patients. So even if they live in a community with very few doctors, they're still advantaged into the degree of their insurance type. So um, so I wanted just to emphasize, well, I, I hope these are useful and interesting analysis of sort of looking at now how telehealth is being used with that major limitation that I can only see the telehealth that I can see in claims. So how much, again, going back to that whole thing, of the iceberg of telehealth, how much am I seeing? I don't know. But with that in mind, what I would argue is that right now, telemedicine nationally equals telemental health and direct-to-consumer telemedicine. And everything else right now is very little, um, which is, uh, I think, just interesting as we sort of think about that population level effect. The um, other thing I wanted to think about a little bit is, is that the numbers here despite the fact that the numbers are into the hundreds of thousands are still relatively small. So if we look at those numbers here, 
um, 140,000 telemedicine visits in Medicare in 2014. Again, if we look projected out, maybe about a quarter of a million in 2016. About 100 to 120,000 visits in that one health plan in 2016. Those are big numbers. But given the population and the number of people there and the number of visits per thousand, it's still small potatoes. And one of the things that I've been interested in is that if you start con contrasting this, like I'll just, we just published a paper on e-consults that came out a couple uh, weeks ago. And there, in a single health system, we had 140,000 e-consults in a year. Or uh, and so if we broaden our examination of telehealth beyond the video conferencing, uh, or I guess telephone <laughs> in the case of teledoc uh, visits, we start to see much very different numbers. So this is just one health system, the number of e-consults they're doing in a given year. And if we start looking even more broadly, the patient portals, tens of millions of adults in the United States have an access to a patient portal and are messaging with their providers. And another thing that I actually, as a doc, didn't even really know that much about until I got involved with this research was symptom checkers, which I'll describe in a second. But our rough estimate is 100 million visit uses of these tools a year. And so you start contrasting that with a couple hundred thousand visits versus 100 million visit uh, uses of these tools. You start to wonder, are we missing the forest <laughs> for the trees in terms of where the impact of telehealth is? So in the last 15 minutes, what I thought, it, just for your interest, um, we started to do, uh, we published a paper in 2015 examining <coughs> these symptom checkers uh, in the BMJ that was, because uh, it came up, uh, funded by the NIH, uh, the Allergy and Infectious Disease. And w this was the effectiveness of symptom checkers for self-diagnosis and triage. So self-diagnosis in the internet, about a third of the U.S. population um, uses the internet for self-diagnosis. And I don't have to convince all of you here, it's very confusing. Uh, Google, or somebody who commented Bing, they're <laughs> equally confusing in terms of trying to get yourself. Um, and um, how effective, uh, so there's been this real need for both how do I diagnose myself? Are there tools that are better out there? And also with this huge array of different care options out there, where should I go for my care? Because besides the fact what's wrong with me, I think the thing that I think most patients are struggling with is, should I stay home? Should I have grandma's chicken soup? Or should I be in an emergency department? Should I go, and oh my god, there's that direct-to-consumer thing, and then there's the urgent care, and there's the retail clinic, and there's my doctor. Who should I go to? And that's a real issue that people are struggling with, and not because there is a need, a number of organizations have come in to try to help patients figure that out, and going beyond just Googling your symptoms. Is that a verb, Googling? I don't know. So, <laughs> huh? To Google. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, I should use a better grammar when I say that. So, um, you know, these are a variety of the uh, organizations that are using symptom checkers um, from my own institution at Harvard Medical School, the Mayo Clinic. Um, uh, uh, the UK has a very large symptom checker that they use that also uh, uh, is used in Australia. And then a lot of private companies, oh, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, but then a lot of private companies like Isabel, WebMD, uh, FreeMD, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> let me walk you through how this works. Um, this is iTriage, one of the more prominent companies. You go to iTriage. This is one from an app. You look at a very scary looking avatar. You click on the avatar on where is, what is bothering you. Or in some other cases, you actually just type in and they use natural language processing to try to help you figure out what's going on. Then they give you a potential set of diagnoses, rank ordered in terms of their likelihood. And then they say, on the triage side, what you should do. Seek care now, or free MD is uh, saying, going to doctor's office, doctor e-visit recommends that, or a retail clinic. So it gives you a variety of different ways that this data is presented. These symptom checkers are used a lot. We looked at web traffic, and we also just looked at published sources. Uh, NHS, the, again, the UK health system reports just in their country for their symptom checker, 12 million uses per year. I triage 50 million uses per year. And these are just two of those companies. 
And I think, again, just to emphasize the point, you know, I got into the study, I'm a doc, I've never had a patient come to me and tell me they use one of these. So it was kind of this weird thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much usage of these tools, yet there had been relatively little evaluation. Are these tools free to use? They're free? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So while we're talking here, well, after I'm done talking, uh, <laughs> you can go down and get iTriage or many of these other ones. And they use, you know, variety. Like, I'm never quite sure how these companies survive, but it appears to be ad revenue and other things that they're using. Um, so why are these actually beneficial? I mean, it's very easy for us to say, ugh, people using the internet. But let's be very clear that there are clear benefits for patients. You know, we have a problem if we think particularly of the issues of stroke and high, uh, myocardial infarction or heart attacks. Patients don't get into care as quickly as they need to, and maybe this would be a way to address that. We have our doctor's offices, our EDs, urgent care, a lot of visits that are for self-limited illnesses. If we just told people, stay home, have grandma's chicken soup, we'd both help the patient as probably help our health system in terms of spending. And you know, it's a remarkable, when you look at, say, pediatric practices, but uh, adult internists, there's a large fraction of those visits that could be handled elsewhere. Maybe we could increase the PCP supply, because that's a big issue in our healthcare system, shortage of primary care, as well as specialists. And let's also be clear, we now live in a different era where more than half of patients in the United States who have insurance through their employer have a high deductible health plan. So going to the doctor is no longer a 10 or $20 encounter. I was out of town and my wife took my kid to the pediatrician. It was $170. It's a lot of money and I'm a wealthy, you know, uh, we're a wealthy family. For other patients, that a dollar sum just to go to your doctor, your, your primary care provider is a large amount of money. On the concern side, though, I'm, I'm not, you know, all of you are well aware, you know, misdiagnosis, mistriage, increase unnecessary medical visits. If they tell everyone to go get care, then we're going to actually worsen the problem as well as in confusing advice to the public. And I do hear from my colleagues and myself, you do have people coming in who are convinced they have one problem when they don't have that problem. So what we did was, in this study, we used uh, standardized patient vignettes for uh, a bunch of symptom checkers to test their diagnostic accuracy and their triage advice. And this is a methodology we've used in this study, as well as several other studies with telehealth companies where we use secret shoppers, basically. We basically pretend to be a patient, go out to these companies, and see what happens. And so we published a, uh, another paper that I alluded to yesterday in JAMA Internal Medicine last year where we did a secret shopper study of a bunch of direct-to-consumer telemedicine companies. I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to speed up and tell you what we found. Um, we did a lot of symptom checker companies. We looked at a variety of different patient vignettes from patients who had appendicitis, otitis, uh, ear infections, allergies, and so forth. And we wanted to look across the range of things where you should stay at home to things that you should be in the emergency room right away. And we took these vignettes from, we didn't make them up, we took them from questions that are given to physicians on board exams and others to try to generate these cases. Um, so this is one example of, of the appendicitis case. We looked, so these symptom checkers do not just give you a single diagnosis. They give you a range of different diagnoses in rank order. So we said, well, did it get it right on the first diagnosis, or did it get it within the first three or the first 20? I'm not sure 20 people are going to scroll down to 20, <laughs> but we want it to be as inclusive as possible. Um, we checked triage in a, a bunch of different ways. Um, so the overall diagnostic accuracy. Across the vignettes, uh, the 45 vignettes and the thousands of cases we put in, I put a poor research assistant <laughs> who went through like every symptom, <laughs> symptom checker company <laughs> going through and pretending there. So she uh, earns a medal for diligence. Um, in terms of the diagnos diagnostic accuracy, top diagnosis, 33%. If we look at the top 20, 60%. Ouch. I don't know. Oh, that's, not so good. that's not so hot, <laughs> uh, no matter how we measure it. Um, in terms of triage, uh, the correct diagnosis first, we did see a little bit of difference. For example, self-care, the, the um, more simple conditions, they got the diagnosis more accurately than those were that were the emergent problems like meningitis, heart attacks, et cetera. That's not good. <laughs> um, and I'll skip this here a little bit. In terms of triage advice, 
Um, we found the correct triage advice was given 56% of the time. 80% of the time, they said, go get care right away for the emergent cases. I think this is probably the biggest and other concerning finding was that for self-care, these are conditions that we judged, a bunch of docs sitting around saying, you should stay at home, allergies, bronchitis. Um, and the vast majority of the time, these symptom checker companies told the patient to go get care. And so they gave the wrong triage advice. So that's another thing. And that makes sense if you have a, one of these companies and you're out there putting advice, you're risk averse. But to the degree that this is a helpful product for patients to try to help them figure out when they should seek care, right now the symptom checkers companies are just basically get, telling everyone, go get care. So I'm not sure it's that helpful for users. Um, a large, wide variation in terms of their performance. So that's one other thing to really emphasize. One symptom checker company does not make an, another. So for example, Isabel did quite well in terms of his diagnostic accuracy, while Symptomate did not do so hot. Um, so diagnostic accuracy in the top 20, 60% rate of appropriate triage advice, 56%, and this issue of risk adverse advice. So one question you can go there and say, okay, tell mom, tell your cousin, <laughs> to whoever else, don't use one of these companies. But I guess we came away from this also recognizing that what's the alternative? If the alternative is to go see a physician, okay, yes, I totally get that the physicians are probably having higher diagnostic accuracy and better triage. <laughs> diagnostic accuracy in studies have been around 85 to 90% among physicians. But is it good enough? Is it what, if the alternative is doing nothing, if it's calling your grandma, if it's you know, Googling your symptoms, maybe this is better advice than none. So I think we should be careful in terms of how we interpret these results in terms of recognizing, again, to use the research language, what's the counterfactual? What is the alternative when we look at this? Um, and then the other thing I wanted to emphasize is that, yeah, this triage rate is horrible at 56%, but if when people have done studies of telephone triage lines with nurses, not so much higher, and yet we fully accept that telephone triage lines are good and most pediatric offices have them, yet their advice is not that much better than these symptom checkers. So lots of vignette limitations. We did a follow-up study where we gave the same vignettes to doctors and uh, we found that doctors had better performance and that made doctors feel better. Um, and uh, <laughs> so let me wrap up because I only have a couple minutes here. In terms of, uh, I guess I had four points. The first is I'm excited to be part of this first conference here on research and telehealth. It's an exciting thing, and obviously I hope from this work as well as some of the other work, this is what I love, and um, so I'm excited to hopefully join this community. In terms of looking at where telehealth research is going, I, I at least advocate that it really needs to be focused on outcomes at, the, uh, at a population level, and I think that's the key thing for us to demonstrate that telehealth is providing value, and that's both for our patients as well as policymakers. The second point that right now, as much as that you can take the word tele, you can use tele and put it in front of almost anything out there, in reality it appears that out there, at least what we're seeing in the Medicare and the commercially insured, the vast, vast majority of these visits are for two things, these direct-to-consumer telemedicine companies and telemental health. And then some of the numbers I showed you as well as the research I presented on symptom checkers makes me think that in terms of population effect, as much as there's been excitement, interest in video conferencing visits for specialty care or in direct to consumer with a primary provider, the numbers are so much higher in some of these other forms of telehealth and so we need to also focus those and hopefully do more research in those. So I think I have, Three minutes for questions on the symptom checker study or anything else I presented. No, I'm just, I'm just want to understand the difference. There seems to be a bit of a disconnect between what we're funding in Bacori and what you're presenting. Uh, we have a lot of studies looking at mobile health um, for managing multiple chronic conditions or the chronic disease population, and it's the health systems that seem to be investing in these types of things. But that doesn't figure at all in the picture that you're painted here. 
So um, I think it's an important point. So when we think about other applications of telehealth, mobile applications, um, what I'm thinking of is a lot of apps and other things that people are using to try to manage both their chronic illness or a lot of these symptom checkers are also apps. So I think it's a really important point. We do see a lot of conversation. A lot of the health systems that I've worked in have introduced those products. What kind of numbers they have, I don't really know. And um, I think I appreciate the point. I showed you data from a commercially insured population and two other forms of telehealth. There's a pretty long list. But I would also emphasize to you that the M Health things, maybe that's also another example of where that should be our, more of our focus as opposed to the live visits between a provider and a, uh, and a patient. Oh, thanks. Um, Ativ, I, I just wanted to comment on your little um, cartoon that you had of the person that self-diagnosed themselves. So in surgery, I, I do sports medicine surgery, so <clears throat> one of our big issues we have with youth athletes is ACL tears, anterior cruciate ligament tears. So there's all this information out there as to how you fix it, what kind of fixation you use, what kind of graft you should use. And it sounds funny, but it is pretty scary because I get a lot of parents coming up to me already with their like laundry list of the way they want me to fix it. You know, they say, we like this kind of graft. My neighbor had this kind of fixation and they went back to sports at six months, not nine months. So it's not quite like the symptom checker thing you described, but it is funny that people are getting a lot of information online and kind of demanding uh, for some elective procedures, how they want it done. You know, I think it's a really key. So as a physician, I see it all the time where people are coming to me. And I won't deny, I get frustrated and annoyed sometimes. But I also have to acknowledge that we are in a different era in 2017. PCORI is about the patient-centered outcomes. I think a lot of people would look at what you're seeing from those uh, in your case, parents who are coming in and applaud and say, this is exactly the way we need to move to the health system. It makes your life a lot more <laughs> difficult, but I don't know. I mean, I think it's a different perspective in terms of whether that's good or bad. Hi, I was uh, actually more of a comment. I was also surprised with the number of people doing the eye triage and self triage. And well, looking at the numbers of the self care, um, and the discordance with the people having to go and get care in person. I'm wondering like where they were sending the patients because I think it would be interesting to find out if they're assuming that you need to be in person because I think a lot of patients also may incorrectly assume that a telemedicine visit is the same as an eye triage as opposed to speaking to a live doctor. Their perception, not our experience, because we obviously know that we have more knowledge than that, but it may be that experience. It'd be interesting to see where they're sending them and whether there's a way to lead them toward telemedicine. Yeah, so some of the companies that are there, their business model, from what I understand, is encouraging people to go get e-visits and telemedicine visits and having direct links to some of these providers, uh, for example, Live Health Online, et cetera. So I think that is one of the, folk, the things that can be done there. Um, whether... I always have to remind myself, there was this really, um, I always come back to a really interesting study uh, called the Ecology of Care that was done where they looked both in the United Kingdom as well as the US and saw how many people get sick every month, how many of those patients think about getting care, and how many of them get care. And if you're on the clinician side, the physician side, nurse, others, you're like, oh my god, everybody and their Aunt Jane is in my office right now because they're sick and they don't need to be here. And those kind of data, I think, from the ecology of care really push back. The vast majority of people who get sick don't even think about getting care. And even among those who actually think about getting care and look for it, only two-thirds actually do get care. So that's one end point. But the point why I brought that up in the context of your question is, is that the market out there, in terms of people who are sick, who are not getting care right now, who could, if it was really convenient and they go to a symptom checker or go to, there's a lot of people out there. You know, we're talking hundreds of millions of potential visits out there. So the market's very large it, uh, uh, for this type of care. Uh, right now, those patients are staying home, but they could go get care. Was there one more? Well, thank you very, very much uh, for your interest.